Welcome everybody. We're going to obviously talk about data management plans today and well I, I best introduce myself first. Catherine Unsworth, data librarian at ANS out of Melbourne. Okay, so the next slide is the three um, circles that ANS has um, in relation to research data assets, you know, making research data assets more valuable for researchers, research institutions and the nation and we do that through our trusted partnerships um, with various communities related to research, also um, in terms of our reliable services such as Research Data Australia, the Research Vocab service as well, the DOI minting services and also in terms of enhancing capability, so building capability within the, the research space around data management. And as part of uh, this webinar is part of that building data management capability for our Australian institutions and obviously research data management plans are a key element in this. So we've got three presenters today, or oh, well, yes we do, um, myself in Melbourne, Natasha in Brisbane and we've also got a Nick Smale from the University of Melbourne who is going to redo his talk that he did at the e-research um, DMP BOF. Now I'm not able to show the slide of the um, DMP and web page and on that page there are a number of tiles with various topics that fall under the um, within that data management plans and you can click out to those and get a lot more information on that there. So moving on obviously today's topic is about research data management and I'd sort of spoken initially about how we'd sort of organised it previously um, but due to the numbers that which is quite exciting that there's so many people um, really interested in this topic. We've decided to break it up into three parts. Um, so we'll have talks, for, um, one from Natasha on the giving us an overview of DMPs and an intro to second generation DMPs. DMP Birds of a Feather recap that we did at eResearch Australasia and Nick will sort of slot, slot into that particular talk as well and he'll talk about DMPs at University of Melbourne and also um, sort of highlight some case studies that we've um, put together uh, or use cases actually not case studies and then it'll be open mic time and that's when we'll be expecting all of you guys to come in and um, you know provide some comment and you know talk about the issues that you are having in your own institutions, what you're doing in your institutions in terms of um, DMPs and the challenges and, and you know, any exciting news around that space as well would be really welcome. Um, and then from there we'll do, we'll, we want to talk about the possibility or, and the interest of um, actually initiating a DMP community of practice. So um, we'll get to that at the end of of our um, talk. But again, just a reminder, tweet, hashtag AnsData, questions to put in the, the question pod. So I'll just throw over to Natasha for her talk. Okay, yeah, so we are really delighted to have a lot of people attending this webinar and I just wanted to say a special welcome to the people attending from Alia Information Online in Sydney and special thanks to Liz Stokes at UTS Library and also to the Alia Executive for helping to make that happen. They've got a special room there where they're tuning in so that's really exciting. Um, but I think when Catherine and I looked at the registration list we realised that there's a really large variety of backgrounds represented in the people attending this webinar. So we're, I'm just going to do a very short overview of um, DMPs and DMP tools and then uh, look at some of the characteristics of DMP version 2.0. So what's a research data management plan? Well, it's a formal document that describes how data will be collected, organised, described, shared and preserved through the course of a research project and beyond. Data management plans are structured to provide needed information about the kinds of data collected, the formats, descriptions, how long the data will be retained, in what manner the data will be disseminated and how data will be preserved over the long term. If you want to learn more about data management plans, I've put in the website to, um, sorry, the link to the ANS website, which includes a guide on data management plans. And also, if you haven't already, you can actually undertake um, more of a look at data management planning tools and so forth through Thing 15 of the ANS 23 Research Data Things program. And I've put the link in there. So Thing 15 actually just 
sparked quite a lot of interesting reflections and discussions um, both in person and on the online meetup boards and I'm hoping that some of the people who contributed to that discussion uh, will share their thoughts at this webinar today. Why do we have data management plans or why do we need them? Um, there's a carrot and the carrot is that well organised and structured data and that's what you have to do when you write a data management plan, is easier to access, analyse, store securely, describe fully and share publicly at the end of a project or even during a project. The stick is that data management planning is actually required by the Australian Code for the Responsible Conduct of Research and some funders, particularly international funders such as National Science Foundation, mandate the completion of data management plans. There are also institutional reasons that uh, for data management plans. Um, one of them is, to, is so that institutions can keep a registry of who at their institution is, uh, has got funds for collecting data and, that, and therefore that will help them if people fill out a data management plan on how they can actually plan their resources at their institution to match the needs as reflected in the DMPs. Also to reduce risk associated with unorganised data collection. So basically if someone at a researcher at, institute, at an institution is asked to verify the results of their findings, they need to be able to produce the data and having a data management plan does help um, researchers to think about that process and to plan for that eventuality. There are also institutions are thinking of ways to um, add to have added incentives to researchers for filling out data management plans and the University of Colorado at Boulder had a DMP competition in 2015 and they put up the winners on the website there and they've actually got a variety of disciplines represented in the winners of that DMP competition so it's worth having a look at that. Also at Curtin University, data management plans are mandated for researchers if you're an HDR student, if you required human or animal research ethics approval and if you want access to data storage at Curtin. There's a range of DMP tools available but probably um, DMP online by the Digital Curation Centre in the UK is probably the most popular and the most used by institutions worldwide. But there are others and I'm not attempting to make any sort of list here but I'm just mentioning QCIF which is the Queensland Cyber Infrastructure Foundation has a, uh, has a platform called Redbox which is uh, used by a number of Australian universities and includes a DMP module. So at International Data Week in the USA in September last year there was some interesting discussions about moving to the next generation of DMP tools, just nicknamed DMP version 2.0. And this picture shows them an afternoon tea that was put on at one of the IDW events and basically you take your apples and you dip them in the peanut butter and it's surprisingly delicious. And by the way, this is the only time you will see apples and peanut butter on an Anne slide. <laughs> but for me, there's an allergy, analogy here to make, and that is that apples represent the first version of data management planning tools, and when you dip them in the peanut butter, you get version 2.0. So explaining in a little bit more detail, the apples or first version of DMP tools are basically just a PDF or Word document something that's, they're, they're not connected to any other system at the university, they're sort of just standalone, fill out this form type things. Um, you complete them at the start of a research project and then that's it. You walk away, you've done your DMP now. Um, the outcome of is not measured, so we don't know if a researcher did what they said they were going to do in their data management plan. Um, the DMPs are not machine readable, mainly because they're just in that PDF or Word document. And they're also private, so it's only researchers and the institutions who can actually see the data in the DMPs, they're not shared. So there's some dis questions around the effectiveness of that. Um, you know, do they just prove that researchers can fill out a form um, or do they prove that researchers are actually thinking about what to do with their data? Is it a way of prompting them to, to consider things that they wouldn't have considered if they didn't fill out the data management plan? And there's no follow-up again on whether you did what you said you would do. Okay, so you get the apples and you add the peanut butter and you get DMP version 2.0.
And the idea of this is some work being done um, for a project called EAGER, E-A-G-E-R, which is led by Victoria Stodden and funded by the National Science Foundation. And I've put a link to her talk at the bottom of the slide there. And in that day, she is looking at the next generation of data management planning tools. And some of the characteristics of the 2.0 versions are that they are public do documents. Now there's actually some debate around whether DMP should be public or not and it's sort of, well, they should be public. The arguments for being public are so that uh, people are accountable with what they say they're going to do. The arguments against are more along the lines of, well, that then people can simply copy one of the public ones and make that their own. DMP's version 2.0 are also something that's measurable. So did you, uh, did you do what you said you were going to do in your data management plan? They're ones which are connected to at least one system. Um, plans which are also machine readable and the richness in that is that you can um, mine information from them. So um, institutions will be able to get some information by using the machine readable access to find out you know, what, um, what, their re what their researchers are going to do with their data and therefore put resources into supporting, what, supporting that end basically. Also that the data that's described in the DMPs is consistent with the FAIR principles, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And also the concept that DMPs are a flexible living document. You don't just create them once at the start. You're going to, through the course of your research project, actually rethink some of the things that you thought at the start and therefore you go back to the data management planning tool and say, oh, I've decided to store my data here and not there. So this idea um, of machine readable DMPs and the EGA project was actually something raised by Chris Erdman from North Carolina State Universities at the eResearch Australasia Birds of a Feather session. So I'm going to hand over now to Catherine who's going to talk to you a bit more about that. This is what we called the BOF, DMPs aligning use to motivations and intended outcomes. And part of the abstract was, you know, to sort of look at what the uh, you know, the mechanisms for researchers to state their intentions on how they would manage their data across the life cycle were. And we looked at, um, you know, well, we were hoping to have a look at, you know, the, the agents and motivations and how they, they are different. And there was a number of use cases that we came up with to in, in examine and interrogate, which um, Nick will talk about a little later on. Um, but we were looking at the multiple agents of funding bodies and uh, to, to encourage data sharing, but the main thing here is to look at the questions here in terms of why implement a DMP tool, does DMP use align with an agent's motivations and more importantly with intended outcomes, um, what are the expected outcomes and enterprise level DMP tools, one size fits all, what is their place in the landscape and is best practice for research as an aim or a hope for byproduct. The first speaker that we had up was, as um, Natasha mentioned, Chris Erdman, who's the Chief Strategist for Research Collaboration at um, North Carolina State University. And uh, he first of all talked about the services at North Carolina and there's an article that this uh, DMP service written by Cross and Davis around what they're doing at North Carolina State University and at the moment uh, it, it's probably a really, really useful article to read but they're offering a DMP review service so their librarians actually help uh, researchers review their DMPs. He also went on to talk about um, you know, the future around machine readable DMPs which Natasha has already talked about and the, the EGA project which is basically you know this is really allowing funders to identify trends in data and software submission repository use uh, patterns and carry out other analyses that consist in understanding community use patterns and needs and that's also you know, if you if you take it from an institutional perspective, something that's quite interesting for institutions to have that kind of information too. Mm -hmm. He also, as Natasha also spoke about, uh, actually publishing DMPs so that they they are more transparent and accountable. And he gives an example here of the DMP for more investigator in data driven discovery in its data discovery grant. And also part of his talk was about access plans, public access plans as not opposed to DMP plans but just a, a different approach to how we would um, you know, accumulate the, the sort of 
information that we need from what researchers are doing with, within their projects and the creation of data. So the, our second speaker was Sue Cook from CSIRO and I've just put up her goal slide. Um, so helping the research group to, to, to reach, document and communicate data management decisions. And so obviously, you know, we're, whenever we're talking to researchers, we talk about it being a live document. Uh, we're also very interested in the interoperability between systems, so being able to push metadata from, you know, existing, well, pull metadata from existing systems and then pull that metadata to other systems as well. And Sue talked about guided questions, which, you know, is basically sort of scaffolding the process of filling out a, a research data management plan for researchers. It's, you know, providing them with some guidance as they go. Also, um, minimum mandatory questions and also conditional questions where if you answer this question, then, you know, you need to answer the, the next five questions or you don't have to answer the next five questions. And she also um, spoke about researcher uh, driven and so their engagement with researchers was quite strong in the, the work that they're doing with implementing and developing their, or developing and implementing their D, DMPs. And she was talking about future aspirations. So they're not there yet with the full integration into organisation, project proposal and planning systems. And also about metadata cascade, which is a term that came up at UQ evidently, uh, through all data management ecosystems. And so, you know, metadata being reused for the data repository, metadata reused for storage provisioning requests and so on. And also she spoke about machine actionable, which is obviously a pretty hot topic around DMPs and persistent URLs. And then we had uh, Libby Blanchard from Central Queensland University who her, the, the central tenet, I think, of her talk was around the working party and the fact that the working party had representatives from the library, from IT, from the research office, e-research and also risk management and, and ethics as well. So it was quite a broad working party and they're, they're basically looking through all of the issues around, you know, in terms of implementation, which tool do they, they choose to start with and how they how they actually then link that to policy and procedure. So they have a policy in place at the moment that actually mandates the completion of DMPs and then in terms of policy and procedure, socialising that across the university, the, you know, the complexity that that involves and, and the work that that involves as well. Then looking at the actual way they would present the DMP in terms of you know user experience and all of that sort of stuff, and then of course the the big the big ticket item is the systems integration, um, which is you know still a ways off for them obviously, and you know they're at very very much at the beginnings of the, this process. So now I'll pass over to Nick to talk about what's happening at um, the University of Melbourne. Fantastic, great to be here. Um, I was just going to talk a little bit about the University of Melbourne DMP um, and the process we went through in making the new DMP. I should just start off by saying that uh, Peter Nish is really leading this effort at the university, but I'm just here putting my own views to, to, uh, forward. So the University of Melbourne developed DMP in 2011 um, and briefly it contained two forms, two separate forms that researchers had to look at, about 90 separate questions that researchers had to fill in. The DMP template alone had three and a half thousand words in it that you had to read. Uh, there was a 12,000 word, 40 page guidance document called Procedures and Guidelines for the Management of Research Data and Records that you were supposed to read to complete this document. It was also a according to policy, mandatory, although there's very little evidence of any researchers actually doing it of their own free will. And it's also had no definite stated purpose, just vague words, data management, no, nothing really very all that specific. So I, I sort of think of this, and it's a word that's been used a little bit, as being a monster DMP. It's just huge and it made no inro inroads into the research uh, community at all, wasn't actually used. Why is it there? Why do we have, why are we spending bandwidth on it? So um, in 2016 there was the idea, let's make a new DMP. Um, I'm not going to tell you too much about that new DMP, um, it's still sort of in development, but I'm going to tell you two things. And Firstly, uh, all of those numbers on, in the left-hand columns, they're much smaller in the right-hand columns now. We certainly 
uh, asking researchers to complete 90 separate questions or read two separate forms. Um, and the other thing I'm going to say is that when we first started working on this, we really thought about what are the reasons why you'd want a DMP? What is the purpose of this DMP? What are the different, why, and all these, these different reasons why you might want researchers to do DMPs should theoretically produce DMP templates that actually look quite different. So we thought, well, we want to make a good DMP template. What is a good DMP template versus a bad DMP template? But there's just very little research has gone into this. No one's really said, this is what a good DMP template should look like. This is what a bad DMP template looks like. Don't do that. And in fact, the problem's a little bit worse than that. And I'll, I'll put it this way, and I made, I made the same offer at eResearch, some of you might remember. I'll give $50 to anyone who can show me any non-anecdotal and systematic evidence that DMPs have any benefits for anybody. And that's a pretty, I mean, I think someone, there must be some evidence out there somewhere, but I haven't been able to find it. I know Catherine's not been able to find it. So if anyone has that evidence, please come forward and I'll happily give you $50. It's a one day only offer though, so don't go out and... <laughs> get on um, R and start doing all sorts of stats right now because that doesn't count. Yeah. So there are many different reasons why you might want to have a DMP and I guess we really sort of drilled down and we thought what's the reason why the University of Melbourne wants to have a DMP for researchers um, and I guess the reason we came up with is that we want to help them with their own project management, do a good job. There are also some secondary benefits around using it as a, collecting that data and using it to help plan out how much uh, space we need to uh, procure for, uh, for our systems and all, all that sort of thing. There are other benefits but the real main driver is that we want to benefit the individual researchers who are doing it. So Catherine and I have sort of thought through what, what are the different use cases of why we would want to have DMPs mandated and secondly how do you how do you and you should how do you measure the outcomes of whether those use cases are actually working for you and so we've sort of got four together here and you might want to um, add your own or help us or refine these but the first one I'll, I'll just briefly go through these is that we, we think that uh, one of the reasons is that funding bodies in particular really want researchers to complete DMPs because they think that that will encourage researchers to share their managed share their data and that increases the return on that public investment in that research data and if that's the case then we should be measuring that we should be saying researchers who do DMPs are sharing more data um, there sh someone should have done that analysis and as far as I can tell no one's really done that and maybe one person has and they really found that actually researchers aren't more likely to share their data and that was a US study that was quite small Another one is institutions might require researchers to complete DMPs to uh, create changes in research research behavior and culture and use it as an educative tool. So the measure there would be researchers who do DMPs are more efficient and productive, produce more papers in a set period of time. That should be a pretty simple analysis to do, uh, still hasn't been done all that much. Um, another one is institutions require researchers to complete DMPs to basically use it as a business intelligence tool, use it to plan out um, the create uh, acquisition of data and other resources and look in what, what uh, data sharing platform should be invested in um, and the measurable outcome there would be actual the use of those that, that information in decision making by the institution um, and I know there are a few institutions that have, have sort of started to do that and it would be really great to see how that's going. Um, and the final major use case is that, uh, and this is perhaps the original use case that really in, that DMPs were invented for in the 1970s, is, and that's some um, researchers using DMPs as part of their routine project management, design and planning. So it's researchers going out, creating a DMP, and using that to share with fellow researchers and share with others to help them understand what everyone's roles and responsibilities in collection of, and management of data are. Um, so, uh, pro so that would really be that projects that use those DMPs would be more efficient and better capitalized. Um, so I, I think that when, whenever talking about DMPs and the DMP with the apple and the peanut butter um, together, I think what's really important and an extra idea to add there in my opinion is to really think about why. Why do we want to make DMPs uh, perhaps mandatory or why do we want researchers to use them and really think about what should that DMP look like depending on what that use case is. So that's all I have to say. Back to you, Catherine. Thanks, Nick. So during the BOF, um, we did a live poll as well and asked a number of questions of our audience. And um, it was probably only a, a small sample, really, in the end, if we um, really thought about it. But the, the first question was, in the Australian context, what do you see as the main motivations for institutions implementing DMPs? And so we asked people to rank those. and. The first one, not surprising, and I think if you bear in mind the, the sorts of people that were in the audience, 
would probably mostly be librarians, data managers, e-research folk and not too many researchers um, that the funders and institutions demonstrating to government return on investment um, through requiring best practice in data management was going to be the, the top of the list. And then in second came that the institutions can capture information about the generation of research data, so the business intelligence tool uh, use case. And then of course Coming in third, not too far behind the institutions capturing information, was the educative tool. So, you know, funders and institutions wanting uh, researchers' behaviours to be align better with best practice and using DMPs in that, that way. And, of course, the fourth one was basically, you know, recognising the benefit, researchers themselves recognising the benefit and utilising DMPs as just a routine part of project management. Catherine, I just have a question related to this from Gareth Denyer, who's asked how many participants in that survey. Um, I think it was around about 28, Gareth, but I'm not a. It, some of the the actual questions, you know, not everyone answered each of the polls, so but it was around about that that size sample, so not a lot. And the next one, the next question was, are we seeing changed RDM behaviours in researchers as a result of DMPs? And this is kind of um, a good one, I think, because you know, 11% of that sample said yes, 17% no. But as uh, Nick was saying, we just don't have any evidence to support whether DMPs are in fact translating into changed behaviours by researchers. So 72% said basically not sure. And I think you know, really, if we're we're going to get serious about DMPs and the, the benefits that they have for researchers in terms of efficiency and and uh, that, that translation into best practice, then we, we really need to do some research in this area and find out just what's happening. Um, and then the next question was, should Australian funders follow the lead of international agencies and mandate a requirement for DMPs? I was so disappointed with the result of this poll, I have to say, um, because 82% said yes to compliance and, and mand mandating uh, DMPs by funders and institutions and I actually from a personal perspective believe that compliance actually changes a, a person's mindset and with researchers they will then just do the barest minimum that they have to because that's what they have to do and rather than looking at it in terms of a, a benefit to themselves and, and their own workflows and, and practices so um, I was and again, but you, you need to bear in mind that the audience here uh, are basically from that administration point of view, so it would make it easier for them as administrators if um, funders did follow the lead of inter international agencies. And then the final question we didn't get to actually ask, but would you be interested in joining a local DMP interest group that could fit into and connect with international initiatives? We did ask it verbally, but we didn't get a chance to actually poll people because we ran out of time. And a few people came up and said that they would be interested in joining such a group. And so that's one of the questions that we're going to have for you guys a little later on. So just bear that in mind. So um, I will wind up. Thank you, Natasha, for moving me along. Um, thanks, everyone.